I think he's going to have uh, things to tell us from a number of different angles. I think you're on mute. There you go. Yes. Her work has been described as startling in its simplicity, and here's an example of why. Because you look at this and it doesn't look simple. But after you've read her description of it, it is simple. This is, this is typical of her work. She, she made things look so simple. Um, it's been ex extremely influential for that reason. And, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, right. One sign of that influence, Time Magazine, when they decided to do this retrospective of women of the year going back to, to uh, 1920. Well, 1920 was the suffragists and it was not gonna be anything else. But I talked with the reporter who was doing the the article about Netter, and it was clear she she wanted nineteen she wanted nineteen twenty one for Netter. So Netter got next after the suffragists. I wouldn't. There's a lot of great women in that series, but I'm kind of happy that Netter got got next after after them. Um, her most cited work is these conservation theorems that have been used in physics in in various different ways. Um, mathematicians know her for completely different work in abstract algebra, and they don't cite her for it because they name things for her. Um, you don't have to cite her because it's all called Natarian this, Natarian that. Um, but what was less known, what people have not known about her, and it's been really mm -hmm. exciting to discover, she had a project to, to algebraize all of mathematics. She was not just interested in abstract algebra. She wanted to make all of mathematics algebraic. And this really has happened to a very large extent. She's, she's had a huge influence on how we actually do mathematics, not just the parts that she did herself. We'll see some of the other people that did, that did some of it. She was born in Erlangen, Germany, a little town in, in the south, a sleepy town, a very sweet town. 1882. She had three younger brothers, the family. Her father was a mathematics professor. And this was at a time when there were only about six or eight mathematics professors in Germany. It was Being a professor was a big deal when, when she was born. Um, I, I call this the long 19th century. Get again right up until the World War I was a 19th century town. It was very, very sleepy, kind of old fashioned. But it doesn't mean the people weren't looking ahead. Her parents, it, it becomes clear when you, when you read about them, before they even had children, they intended all their children to get doctorates. This was just gonna be a thing for the Netters. The Netter children were all gonna have doctorates. And when the firstborn was a girl, that plan just didn't change. Now, a, a lot of leading German mathematicians at that time supported education for women. It was a novel idea. The first PhD for a woman in mathematics in Germany was 1874, awarded by very influential Felix Klein, who was also a friend of, of Emmy's father, um, and to a foreign woman. And that's important. German women at that time would not have been allowed to get it. But already in 1874, a woman had gotten a German PhD in, in, in mathematics. Her parents, uh, one of her brothers was not very healthy, but the other three of them, they all got doctorates. That, that, was, that was the plan all along. Um, her life in Erlangen, Hermann Weil, a very influential mathematician and a, and a great essayist, in a eulogy to her, said there was nothing rebellious in her nature. She was willing to accept conditions as they were. And I think he got that from her little brother Fritz, seen here in this picture. She and Fritz were very, very, very close. And I suspect it was true up until age 33 in Erlangen. Up until then, she was not rebellious at all. She was teaching math courses in her father's name. She was a respected researcher. We'll get into that. She was never going to have a job. It was not legal for a German woman at that time to be to have a job as a professor, let alone with the universities have it. But, but that was okay with her. The family was very well off and she was, was respected. I think it's probably true that up until that age, there was nothing rebellious in her nature. 
Uh, it is true that, that uh, in 1887, when she was five years old, it's possible that she irritated the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. It's, it's really very possible. Um, we know that Nietzsche have stayed in this hotel in Zilsmaria, Switzerland, where he tells us he wrote to his mother he, uh, he enjoyed conversations with a mathematics professor from Erlangen, Nutter, that would be Emmy's father, uh, Nutter, an intelligent Jew. Nietzsche, but, he, but Nietzsche complained that the dinner hour was hot, too crowded, about a hundred people, many children, noisy. We don't know whether Emmy was noisy or, or whether she was bothered by the noise. It's just, just not something we know. Um, we do know that she got good grades, except for practical classroom conduct, she was satisfactory. Well, we don't know. We don't know why she wasn't outstanding in practical classroom conduct, but uh, we, we do have that about her, but that's not exactly rebellious. Her father, a professor, one of two professors in Erlang, and that's her father there on, on the left, Max Netter, and family friend Paul Gordon on the right, who became Emmy's teacher when she, when she went to university to study math. Things were changing fast. Um, they changed the law so that women could attend universities. There's a, a, there's a lot to know about that, but she did start. And she became a student of, of Paul Gordon. Um, and she tells us this is a lot. The reason I want you to know how she described him is a lot of 19th century was mathematics was like this and her mathematics was like this for the first half of her career. Um, she said his lectures rested less on deep knowledge of others works because he read them very little than on an instinctive feel right I mean he didn't he didn't actually read other people's stuff but he just knew what was a good idea. He never did justice to developing concepts from the fundamentals. His lectures entirely avoided fundamental conceptual definitions. Mathematics at this time, in, in the words of uh, Hel Brown, uh, a woman that I don't know if we'll get to her, but uh, as she said, mathematics education at this time depended very strongly on genius. Well, fortunately, Emmy had that. Emmy had that. So this, this kind of education worked for her. She did a dissertation in 1908 with Gordon. She was accepted in a Ita prominent Italian mathematical society, Circolo Matematico di Palermo, in that same year. She was accepted into the German Mathematical Union in 1909, the Deutsche Mathematica Verein, Vereinigung. She was recognized. She was internationally recognized already at this time before she'd done anything that anyone remembers today. This, the work she was doing then is hardly known today at all. She was already internationally recognized. She probably felt that this was a fine career for a woman. Again, she didn't, the family was comfortable. She didn't need the money. And, and a paid job was just not a thing for a woman at that time. It was actually illegal. Not, not just you couldn't get it, it was illegal. So, and I think she was happy with this, I think. We don't, we don't know, but I, th but I think um, her, the woman who married her, her nephew, Emiliana Netter, once said, people tell us that Emmy didn't mind not having a job and didn't mind how she was treated. But the truth is we don't know what she minded. We don't, we don't. But I suspect at this time she, she was happy. And then everything changed. In 1913, she published a plan of what her research was going to be like. This is what a man would have been doing at this age, except that he would have had a title as professor. He would have gotten his first title as a private docent, and he would have published a plan for what his research was going to be. And <clears throat> we know she published such a plan. She probably thought of it as being like the program that a male professor would, would it was like that. <clears throat> It was fantastically ambitious. Anybody at the time might have thought, that's a lot to bite off. In fact, she blew way past it. But at the time, it seemed, it seemed very ambitious. And then the next year, 1914, here's a picture of her hometown of Erlangen. 
in August, August, August 8th, 1914, these men marching in uniform with rifles, they know that war is coming. One week later, Germany declares war. That spring, uh, with a lot of the young men sent into the army, two extremely famous mathematicians, Klein and Hilbert, invite Emmy to come to Göttingen as a researcher. Uh, partly this is because the men were, had been sent away, but also they knew. They knew what she could do. Um, so here in this horrible situation, she's invited to Göttingen. Oh, <laughs> Göttingen was the center of the world for her. Göttingen was to a lot of people the, the leading center of mathematics in the world. And I can promise you that in the Netter family, Göttingen was the center of mathematics in the world. And she's invited to it. She's now gonna be a researcher with all these famous people who have been household names for her growing up. 1914 to 1918, just a brief reminder of what things were like. Two million German soldiers dead in the war, a half a million civilians dead in famine. This, this was a horrible time. Yeah, it was a horrible time. And then it was followed by the German Revolution of 1918 to 19. People don't always remember this, but when the war ended, there was huge chaos in Germany. The government collapsed. Berlin in early March 1919, 1,200 workers and protesting soldiers are killed in demonstrations in Berlin, 1,200 killed by the police, 1,600 arrested. The police were killing people almost as fast as they were arresting them. Nutter at that time joins the Independent Social Democrats. The Independent Social Democrats were a, they had started as a, as a pacifist party. At this time, they were regarded as a lot of Germans, including the German government, the Social Democrats proper, regarded this party as simply a disguise for the communists. There was a communist party, but people thought this was just a disguise for the communists. And Netter joins that, that party. She, she was well known to her colleagues as, as pro-Soviet. Hermann Weil, we'll keep coming back to him. He, in his eulogy, he called them close to the Social Democrats. This is like calling students for democratic society close to the Democratic Party. It's not true. <laughs> um, Netter was a, a, a leftist radical. But she's also doing this math. <clears throat> 1914 to 1915, David Hilbert and Einstein are corresponding on what we would now say creating general relativity. Einstein had created his special theory of relativity that space and time are somehow relative to each other, published in 1905. And this caused a huge problem for gravitational theory because you couldn't make any sense of, of Newtonian gravity in this theory. And, and Einstein felt he needed to, uh, he needed to adapt that because Hilbert and Einstein both take, they take special relativity as an absolute fact and they have very good evidence for this. Once you understood it, you saw it, this was undeniable. And this equivalence principle that, that a, a gravitational field should be locally undetectable. It should be just like accelerating, which has been explained in, in some other talks here. Um, <clears throat> they took that also as, as a fact. Very important, they also took energy conservation as the sine qua non of physics. It's not a physical theory if it doesn't have energy conservation because this is how everything is explained for them in physics, is by conservation of energy. But Einstein's version of GR in 1915 had a serious problem with energy conservation. <clears throat> he could show that the amount of energy, momentum energy that flows into a point was equal to the amount that flows out of a single point. But that's not what anybody meant by conservation of energy. They meant the total energy in a volume can only change if it flows across the boundary. The energy can't just appear or disappear. It can move, 
but it can't appear or disappear. And Einstein's general relativity at this point does not have that. And they're both very bothered by this. Hilbert and Klein consider this not a proper conservation law. These two leading mathematicians, they say this is not a proper conservation law. And Einstein more or less agrees. Einstein pretty much says, yeah, you know, it's not a proper conservation law, but it's the best you're going to get, he says. You're just not going to get better. If we have this general covariance of general relativity, this is just the best you'll get. <clears throat> Hilbert and Klein more or less agreed with that. This has been depicted as a debate. It wasn't exactly a debate. But they, that's what they brought Emmy, Emmy Nutter to get again to work on. Her expertise was about invariance, and they said, come here, come, come, come work with us, talk with us, see what you can come up with on this. And what she came up with was astonishingly simple, astonishingly general, very concise. To her, it was obvious. To her, she said, well, of course this is what it, She said, when you've got physical theories where the symmetries are parametrized by real numbers, they all have conserved quantities. What does that mean? Okay, look, take physics the way you normally understand it. The physical laws don't change when you move from side to side. And it was long known that that was the same as saying that momentum in that direction is conserved. The fact that the laws don't change when you move means there's a conserved quantity that corresponds to movement. And Nutter shows in extreme generality that anytime you've got anything like a physical system, if you've got a symmetry like motion in some direction, where you all you have to say about it is how far it moved, one real number, how far did it move, you'll get a conservation law. But equations whose symmetries are parametrized by functions have only trivial conserved quantities. What does that mean? In general relativity, you can change a whole coordinate system and the laws remain the same. Anytime anything like that happens, she says, you will get no better conservation law than Einstein had for momentum energy. It's a really sweeping proof. You could say it's a very simple proof. It's about four pages long. Um, if, if you try to prevent, present it in modern notation, it gets more like 350 pages long. Um, the, the, this one is a little mysterious. This is one of the mysteries is how on earth she thought of that proof. But, but people saw it, they, they believed it. Uh, she also pointed out that if you have some way to, to break up the symmetry, you'll get some kind of conservation laws. Like, for example, if you've got a heavy body with nothing anywhere near it, the space is asymptotically flat around that heavy body. Now you can get something like energy conservation, what's today called pseudo tensors, and, and people, people use this. You can read in any number of places that Netter solved the problem of energy conservation in general relativity. Uh, but that problem isn't solved. <laughs> Everyone, it's not solved, so it's impossible that she solved it. She didn't solve it. What she did was she radically clarified what kind of solutions there could possibly be. She cleared the ground a, a very great deal. Uh, quantum mechanics found very important uses for this. Her, her second one, the one about continuous, about function parameterized symmetries, was immediately hailed by Einstein, Hilbert, Klein. Uh, it was immediately called terrific work, but somehow it, it really didn't get promoted much. It kind of disappeared for the next few years, partly because what she had done was give a precise proof of what Einstein and Hilbert already thought was probably true. She gives a really precise, beautiful proof, but it's of a thing that people kind of thought was, was true. Einstein writes to Hilbert and Klein and says, why don't you get her a job? You need to get her a job. She doesn't have a job. This is, this, this is disgraceful. He's really kind of, he says, if you don't write to the government about her, I'm going to write to the government about her. Well, Hilbert and Klein were writing to the government about her. Um, they were trying to get her a, a paid position. Um, there's a story that in, 
the mathematicians at Göttingen pretty much all backed her for a paid position. But at that time, a department, a math department couldn't hire its own people. The whole faculty senate voted on everything. And the faculty senate did not want women teaching anything. Very much against letting women teach anything as a whole. And the, the story is that uh, David Hilbert got very angry at one meeting and said, my Herren, we are a university, not a bathing establishment. And we need to keep women out of here. Um, ironically, they did have a bathing establishment, and she was allowed to use that. But it was the, uh, but the university. You know, they would not. They for a long time they kept her from any kind of paid position on the faculty. Um, but did she actually? She did get to use, the, and she did. She went swimming every day. We're told uh, that she went swimming every day, no matter what the weather. Weather didn't stop her. Here's Herman Weil again describing, and this is absolutely correct, the fundal character, fundamental characteristic of her work was this ability to find the formulation that reveals the essential logical nature of the question, stripped of any incidental peculiarities which complicate matters and obscure the fundamental point. She would, she would just make things look so simple correctly. Her algebra her, the, you don't need to read her, the proofs she gave of her algebraic theorems through the 1920s because they're in textbooks today. People still use essentially the proofs she gave for that stuff. Her earlier work, no, no, those proofs are incomprehensible. But this, her proofs are the proofs in textbooks today. He, he was wrong. There's a, it's generally believed that Netter was against computation. She was against algorithms. This is completely wrong. She was against wasting time on computations that didn't need to get done, as was her teacher. But she knew, as her teacher did, that the way you get the most calculations done is to find ways to get around as many as possible. Weil completely misunderstood. She's no, no foe of computation. She just wants to get it done correctly. She wants to get it done efficiently. Her first doctoral dissertation, her first do official doctoral student under her own name was this woman, Greta Hermann, who wrote what's often called the first paper in computer algebra. This is a very highly regarded paper today about computerized algebra. She gave computer versions of some of Netter's abstract theorems. Um, Netter prom promoted her work. Uh, Hermann went into politics. She, she's fairly well known in, in German political history now, party history, not government history. Um, but she didn't stay in math. She went, in, she went into government, into parties. She influenced all kinds of mathematics. Here's what two topologists said about her. Uh, she, she, topology is this subject, you may have heard of it, rubber sheet geometry. We got geometry, we got spaces that can bend and stretch and we wanna talk about their properties. And this is kind of abstract because they have no fixed form. And Nutter is the one who combined this with abstract algebra and what we call algebraic topology today, which is the usual way of doing the subject. And this description that they get that Alexandrov gives of her with all the fervor of her nature she was herself ready to forget what had been done in the first years of her mathematical activity that early stuff that we don't remember much now she was ready to forget that considering these results as standing apart from her true mathematical path the creation of a general abstract algebra but this was to be an algebra that applied to everything and Alexandrov himself is one of the main people who made it the central tool in topology. Uh, here's a picture of some famous people. We don't have time to go in, into all of them. Yeah, her true path was not just about her specific theorems. Olga Towski Todd, a student of Netter in, in Göttingen. Um, Netter was not a gentle little lady. She, she just wasn't. Um, Olga Towski Todd tells us not everyone trusted that her achievements were what they were later accepted to be. She irritated people by bragging about them. She believed in herself. She believed in herself. 
Um, no, she was not her student and colleague in Göttingen, Anne Bryn Mawr, in Germany in 33, as Hitler takes power, Jews are expelled from the universities, people are being beaten in the streets, Kristallnacht, store windows are being smashed. Nutter leaves Germany. She almost took a job in, in Moscow. She spent a little bit of time in Cambridge, England, but she ended up in Bryn Mawr in the US. Um, a short train ride away from Princeton. She would go and lecture in Princeton weekly. Although she says uh, she lectured at the Institute, not at the university where nothing feminine was allowed. Um, Olga worked with her a lot. One of the hard things to know about Nutter, a lot of people who study Nutter, they want her to be a champion of women in mathematics. And, and I like what Sheila Tobias says about this. We should all look to Nutter, admire Nutter, but don't expect her to be everything for us. We can be the feminists for her, is what Tobias said. Um, Olga Towski complained that Nutter, uh, she went to Nutter once for a letter of recommendation. And Nutter said, well, uh, you know, I, I really only write letters for men because they, they have to start families. You'll understand. And Olga tells us she did not understand. <laughs> Nutter was, was, was difficult that way. And yet it was a great experience for Olga to, to work with her. Don't ask Emmy to be everything. She was what she was. She, she had obvious influence on abstract algebra. Everyone knows that. What has been under, underestimated about her, her influence on topology, her influence on algebraic geometry, her influence on arithmetic. This is, I, I won't go into all the generalities, but people have not understood the scope of what Emmy did. She didn't pursue the conservation theorems for long. People say, why didn't she pursue them? Why did she publish them and then let them drop? The truth is, she didn't pursue any of her ideas. She published them, and then she let other people do it. She had students who often did it, except that the student who was going to do the conservation theorem, Bessel Hagen, well, he switched over to history of math. He stopped doing, he stopped doing math. Uh, Gret Hermann, who was going to do the computational algebra, well, she left math for politics. These parts of her work are less known, partly because those students dropped out. She, like I say, she didn't she kept generating new ideas for decades. Um, she died in Bryn Mawr at age 55, still becoming a more and more powerful creative mathematician. It's, it's, it's amazing. But she had no time to pursue what, these, her ideas. So her ideas where her students did pursue them are, are better known than the ones where they didn't. She was, in short, she was a decisive mathematician for the 20th century, huge influence on whole, how math was done through the whole 20th century and still to this day. She had lifelong ardent support, not only from her family, but from all the world's best placed mathematicians. She set out to change how math is done and she succeeded at a level no one could have imagined. On the day she died, no one could have imagined how much influence she was going to have was not possible, not possible, and yet she did. And through all this, she never had a secure job and she never even drew a salary. She was not a modest person. Remember, she irritated people by bragging. And so she wasn't being modest when she said this, but she wasn't wrong either when she said, well, wrote, that's why we still have it. My methods are working and conceptual methods, and so they penetrate everywhere anonymously. Huge influence. Often people don't even, even know it was her because she just, she wrote almost nothing about how she did things. She just did them, and other people started doing them the same way, and that was her. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can stop sharing your screen and then we'll be able to uh, have questions better. I do want to mention, look at this, this picture here. Sure. She's, not, she's not dressed fancy. She's not in a fancy room, but she's working and she's comfortable. I like that picture. 
You can leave it up if you want. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, do we have some questions? Patricia, can I ask a couple of questions? It's Danny. Please do. Uh, two questions. First, um, uh, Colin, you said at the, that she never had a pos paid position or salary. What about at Bryn Mawr? Did she not have a position or a salary there? Well, not exactly a salary. Yes, she was given money. She was given stipends already in Gittigan. The family money ran out. With the hyperinflation, the family money ran out. They were constantly finding some way to give her some money, another way to give her some other money. In, in Bryn Mawr, she was being supported by the Ford Foundation, and they were developing a plan to try to switch her onto the faculty with a regular salary. So she did get money, but it was never, never a regular salary. Interesting, okay, right. thanks. And the other question I had was her doctoral student, what is it, Greet? Greta, Greta Hermann. Yeah, you put up some work that she did that sounded to me like the very foundation of worst case analysis and algorithm development. Was she the first one to actually come up with that concept? Well, I have not verified that for my, myself, but a lot of people do say, yes, she was the first person to realize that if you're going to call something an algorithm, it's not good enough to give some steps that will work. You must give an estimate proving how long they will take, or it doesn't count. She, she may have been, she was certainly among the first, and a lot of people say she was the first. I just haven't researched it enough that I want to. Okay, thanks. Very interesting. It's not enough to have a computer program. You have to know that program will run, that it will work. <laughs> Joe Lamana, did you have a question? You unmuted. Yeah, no, not really. I was uh, debating whether to. Uh, make the uh, point that uh, by her name, she kind of is the solution to the Michelson-Morley experiment. No ether. No ether. <laughs> I'm sorry, I guess I chose wrongly. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Heavens, funny. Um, so is, this is Neil, is, is it uh, fair to say that what uh, Colin just described before Joe's question uh, uh, about being able to state that the algorithm will run, or the program will run, is that in some way related to the church Turing thesis? No, because this is all things where you do have the program. The Church Turing thesis is about saying what things you could have programs for. This is saying when, you've, when, you, when you claim you have a program, when you claim you have an algorithm, you're not entitled to, to that claim until you can show that it will halt. Now, Church Turing's famous theorem is there's no general halt solution to the halting problem. But this is where you've got a candidate algorithm and, and Hermann was one of the first to say, you shouldn't call it an algorithm until you've proven how long it will take to halt on given size inputs. I see. Okay, thanks. So there seems to have been a, a resurgence of interest in her recently. Can you talk about that? Yeah, she's, she's been an emotional favorite for a long time. A lot of mathematicians always said, oh, Emmy Netter, she was good. She was good. She did abstract algebra. Um, there was this, this idea that she was this sort of nice lady who, she didn't mind having poor clothes. She didn't mind having bad food. We, we know from contemporary records that she had poor clothes and bad food, but they didn't mind because she could do math. And it's really starting about, uh, about 30 years ago, so a couple of people started looking into her history and saying, we don't want to know more about her than this. Um, certainly as, okay, mathematics has opened up to women a lot. Um, and 
partly that's that that's part of it is people stay wanting to look more at her actual work. Um, also, in, in my own research, I've been been trying to connect her with the rise of modern methods in abstract in, in algebraic geometry, not just the theorem she proved in 1922, but what the methods that she used, the methods that she taught to her students over and over again, her best ideas aren't given to us in her words, they're given to her to us in her students' words. And I, I've been, been pursuing that and so, some other people have been pursuing it. Partly the climate is just friendlier to knowing history of women in mathematics, but also her, her ideas continue maturing, continue developing. And, and some of us have been looking more into that, how they've, they've gone on developing. I have a question. Do you know if um, Emmy had any collaboration with uh, Gensen in Göttingen in um, the whole computational kind of area of mathematics? No, she she seems not to have. Um, she was very friendly with Ernst Zermelo. She was friendly with Erbron. Gensen, I don't e even know that if she was friendly with Bernays. I don't, Gensen, I don't even know if she was, if was friendly with. Um, I would like to know more about that computational work with Hermann. Um, how much of that was Nutter's idea? How much was Hermann's idea? Hermann, um, she was never really determined to go straight into math. She was already interested in philosophy. So I wonder if a lot of that wasn't Emmy, but it's just, it's just not known right now. But no, I, uh, connections with, with Genson, I, I, I don't know of any. Thank you. Hirsch, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, uh, I guess I just typed it up as well. But, um, you know, basically it mentioned that she was a very prolific generator of ideas. And I was wondering how she shared her ideas with people. Uh, did she leave behind notebooks? Did she just communicate with the students and colleagues? Yeah, it, it starts with, with students. She was a very popular lecturer with the very best students. She was madly fast paced. She was just ripped through ideas. And a lot of students had trouble keeping up with her. But a lot of people who went on to become great mathematicians loved keeping up with her. So it starts with people in, in her lectures. Um, Saunders McLean, an American mathematician, describes how one day, Emmy announced with distaste that due to a national holiday, the university would be closed the following, the, this day of the following week. She would not allow this to interrupt the development of mathematics, and so we would get together for a walk to a coffee house. She was very famous for these walks. So this group of a dozen, a dozen her and a dozen colleagues and students go walk, they walk four miles out of town to this coffee house and walk back talking about mathematics and politics the whole time. Um, she was, so her, her influence starts with lectures, then in conversations. And of course, as these people take jobs and go elsewhere, then it becomes correspondence with them. That correspondence is valuable. That gives us a lot of information about, about what she, her, her collected works, it's a, it's a vo one volume, 750 pages, and about two thirds of that is authored by other people. She just, she did not put stuff on paper, but conversation, huge amounts of conversation. Yeah, it's, I, I think it would be good to talk a little bit about, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, but, but this is part of the mystery is she left so little record Right. I mean, here she she died in when was it exactly? Uh, uh, 1935. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, and, and yet there's almost nothing. When you started looking into her, you were looking at like scraps of paper. There was absolutely anything you could find. Yeah, there's a bunch of postcards she wrote. Um, and I've, I've seen some of these postcards. You can't read them. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe this is just because my German isn't that good. So I showed them to a German friend. This was a woman of, uh, what is this, 15 years ago, and she was already 60 years old. She looks at these postcards and she says, I can't read these either. So she goes and shows them to her mother, and her mother can read them. It's this, it's this archaic German handwriting. 
that this 85 year old woman in about 1985, she could read it. Um, it's archaic even for Netter's generation, but like I say, get Erlangen where she grew up was that kind of town. So there are these postcards, but there's not a lot on them. Um, I did learn um, Emmy, uh, she really didn't like going to the post office to mail packages. It was just burdensome. That's, that's what I got from the postcards. Um, what I've gotten more from is, is correspondence, newspaper accounts at the time, archival notices where she evaluates other people or other people evaluate her. Also, she was very good at editing collected volumes. Editing, she edits collected works of Dedekind and she writes comments on Dedekind's work. Well, as you can imagine, her comments on Dedekind's work show a lot about her work. She was famous for telling people, oh, it's all already in Dedekind. Nobody else saw it in Dedekind. But when you read her comments, you can see how she saw it in Dedekind. Um, so there's these scraps that you can find, but she did not write much herself. Gittigan was a fantastically self-regarding place. These people knew they were famous and they liked leaving memoirs. Emmy Nutter did not leave a memoir, <laughs> but there are scraps you can find. Oh, we have another uh, uh, Alberto. Uh, oh, where can you find the uh, those comments on Dedekind? In the three volume collected works of Dedekind, you just have to, you, you just, they're page by page, you just have to find them there. Yeah, Dedekind's Gesammelte Werke, mm, they're in there. I've, 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 I've worked a little bit on trying to collect them, but I haven't got them collected yet. So that's not the sort of thing you could find in any uh, of the things you've published so far? Quotes of them, quotes of, quotes of, of bits, but not, not systematically. No, somebody needs to collect them systematically. Probably I will someday. Uh, Michael Lowenstein, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, did, did Einstein help bring uh, Emmy to the US? Uh, I, I don't think his help was needed to get her into the US. He did, uh, he did help to try to get her position. Um, there was talk about trying at Princeton, but that never worked. Um, I, I'm sure he supported it. I'm sure he told people he supported it, but I don't believe, I don't believe there's any documents that he put on, on file to help, to help bring her. Um, they did get her near Princeton. I think uh, a lot of people feel she should have been at Princeton. I think she felt she should have been at Princeton. I think Herman Weil felt she should have been at Princeton. But they got her near. They got her a short train ride away. I should say Herman Weil is an interesting case here because Herman Weil did not like her style of mathematics at all. But he did recognize its importance. And Herman Weil is interesting because he has no objection to women in math at all. Not, it's not a fiber of his body that thinks women can't do math. But honestly, he never thought women could either. I mean, it just wasn't a thing in his world. And you, you see him struggling with this. What am I looking at? I don't like the style and yet I see the results. And it's a woman, I didn't know women did math. So he's a very interesting source, but you have to recognize his limitations as well as his strengths. I'll unmute. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try something here. I don't know if uh, if it's possible, but we have um, a uh, uh, Maribeth Pringle is on, and uh, I wondered if she might be able to give her impressions uh, from a, a you know the the, the feminist uh, sort of issues here. If she might have a a comment or two that she might be willing to make. Uh, maybe she's not in the mood to do it, but we'll see. Mary Beth, are you there? Uh, she may have walked away. Sometimes that happens. All right. What? Oh, oh, there she is. There she is. I, I hear. I'm such a uh, still a novice on Zoom. I uh, unfortunately came in late, and uh, but I'm fascinated to hear the story. Uh, 
uh, of this uh, fascinating mathematician. And uh, it's a name totally unfamiliar to me. And uh, uh, so I'm just curious to uh, uh, hear her story. And, uh, uh, and I'm curious to find out still more about her. Uh, so. Essentially, <clears throat> Everyone who's worked on her, every major biographer who's worked on her in the past 40 years, have all been looking to promote the role of women in mathematics. That's what yeah. draws people to, to, to look at her. Um, but of course, this is, especially for a professional historian, especially in Germany, where people are very methodical, you shouldn't have a viewpoint, you know, you should just be doing scholarship. And so people feel they have to be just very scholarly about it. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot of room for very serious feminist reflection on Emmy Netter, not because she was a feminist, but because she was Emmy Netter, and that's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of room. Yeah. Huh. I am curious, uh, how, uh, am I still, is my mic still on? Yep, you're good. How, uh, how a person who doesn't you know, put material on paper, how that person, uh, you know, establishes the kind of reputation she obviously um, accrued in her lifetime. Uh, and yet it's, it's through, as, as, as I understand, from what I've heard, through these conversations that she had, that she was judged to be uh, 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 eminent in, in the field. Well, she does publish some papers, and for the last 20 years of her life, every paper she publishes starts a new branch of algebra or a new branch of number theory. I mean, she, she oh. publishes some concise, extremely influential papers, but even then, most people couldn't understand them unless they had talked with her. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Huh. Interesting. I think there's been a, a little bit of a problem, you know, not just because her work seems so arcane, right, to, uh, to, to people who, or even to some people that are in some of the fields that are related, but even especially to people who are not uh, in math, um, that uh, there's, there's a tendency to think, oh, okay, well, she was this woman in mathematics, but can you really tell was she really that good or is it just sort of apologetics or why you know how, how good was she this sort of thing and in fact from what I've learned uh, mostly from Colin uh, she was better people don't still don't understand just how important she was and continues to be just as a mathematician leaving aside the question of of being a woman it yeah. would Rip a problem down so simply that when you see her answer, you think, "Oh, well, that's simple," and and it's and, and it's easy to miss the extreme importance of it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. But also, there was just a comment that uh, that I, I oh. Mute. Or I can unmute you. Okay, Thank I'm you. unmuted. I just wondered. Um, she died so young. Did she die of something that she knew she was going to die? And did her poor diet and, you know, her poor food that she had, the lack of security uh, lead into that? Yeah, she was, she was at Bryn Mawr. We have records from people saying that she just, she, she came over, she was a refugee from Germany. She could have been bitter, but she wasn't. She was just delighted. She comes to Bryn Mawr and she meets everybody and she wants to know how Americans do everything. And her students, now the president of Bryn Mawr had studied mathematics in Germany and the chair of the math department knew exactly who Emmy Netter was. And so Bryn Mawr is like, they are extremely happy because it's very ambitious college for women and they have got this woman and they're gonna they're gonna make a this is gonna make a difference for women in, in mathematics. Emmy doesn't think that way, but they thought that way. Her students, there was there's wonderful memoirs from students who just really in, enjoyed working with her. There's a very pretty story by one the 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 four of us, Emmy and four of us students were walking across a cow pasture behind the university. And she says, I must have been the weak sister because I looked at the fence and I thought, 
is she going to be able to get through that? I thought that's no problem for us young women, but this woman of 50, how is she going to get through a fence? And yet Emmy just stepped through the barbed wire and continued. It was really going very well. It was probably the happiest time of her, of her life. And then one day, the news came that she had died in the hospital. This was the first most people knew she was in the hospital. They just heard that she had died. It was abdominal surgery. She died of complications of abdominal surgery. Hmm. And this was completely out of the blue for, for, for most people. I think it's fair to say that this was related. I mean, she was, she was living on starch. She was very obese. And I think that makes abdominal surgery more dangerous. I, I think it's very fair to, to connect that with, with her poor diet. Um, just the, the news just came. Your professor, who last you knew you were going to see again in the fall, is dead. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Uh, and uh, we will see you on Thursday.